All right, welcome back to Honored Madman for another exciting entry into the lore catalog. Today we're going to be talking about a staple of the Dark Souls and just the uh, From Softian franchise as a whole, the rats. Now obviously the concept of giant rats have been a part of the fantasy genre and science fiction genre for a very long time. We've seen them in video games, movies, all kinds of shit. Hey, what about the Rodents of unusual size? Now the first time we see the Soulsian take on rats would have to be in Demon Souls where they served as plague carriers much like their real world counterparts, although obviously they were uh, much larger in size. While you can find their corpses scattered across the various archstones, the live ones are only found in the Valley of Defilement. And if you happen to get bit by one enough times, you'll be afflicted with the nasty plague, which is uh, not desirable to say the least. But they're really only present in that one section of the game, so uh, not really too big of a threat. Anyway, moving on to Dark Souls 1 proper, where we meet the uh, undead rats of varying sizes. Some of them are the size of a small dog, others are about the size of an elephant. And they vary from any and all sizes between those two extremes. The rats also happen to be extremely poisonous, and if you happen to let that poison meter fill, you're in for some of the most potent poison in the game. Basically just a step down from toxic. Definitely something you need to be wary of when starting new characters. Anyway, there are also normal, regular looking small rats too, but they're sort of just a... Uh, well, they're more of a decoration in the depths, if you ask me. And I almost forgot the white-furred snow rats of Ariamis. Now, they could be natives of the painting given the color of their fur, but it's just as likely that rats somehow found their way into the world of Ariamis and eventually adapted to their environment. Either way though, these unique New Vegas looking rats are only found here in the painted world of Ariamis, essentially serving the same role as the normal rats in the rest of Lordran. They seem particularly fond of foraging for food in the various houses found across the uh, painting. But again, they're functionally the same as the regular rats, although there's just no larger variants. I do like that they're snow ones, however, it kind of reminds me of the uh, snowy variant Bulborbs from Pikmin 2. Anyway though, the more common variant of the rodent of unusual size are found across the various sewer systems of Lordran, but by far the largest population would have to be found in the Depths, a place where the banished of the undead Berg are turned into food for the various monsters that lurked within its shadows. But even here, there were no more prolific people eaters than the rats themselves. In fact, these hulking rodents dined on so much human meat that it wasn't exactly uncommon to find a humanity sprite on their person after killing one. No, the rats aren't slowly turning into human, they just haven't fully digested their last meal yet. Now, true to their name, these undead rats do look horrifically undead. They're covered in wounds, large gashes, and have what appears to be sores all over their faces and body. And the one giant one in particular in the depths looks like one of his eyes is popping out doesn't exactly look like a charmed existence. And as I mentioned earlier, these rats tend to stick to deep, dark, and uh, damp places, and are never found in any of the domains of the gods. Places like An Orlando are completely rat-free. Now fast forward to Dark Souls 2, and the rat's singular desire to dig on human flesh is sort of expanded on, or it's at least given a motive. In fact, it actually kind of gives the rats more lore than I ever thought they would get. I mean, at the end of the day, they're just rats. Which is something I would have said before I met the Rat King. Well, where are the keys? And there he sits beside a very large pile of the bones of his enemies. A throne of bone, if you will. He also hangs out in a broken down Pharaoh's contraption which I'm more than certain he's turned into a tunnel of sorts to quickly reaccess the Grave of Saints, giving us the illusion of him being in two places at the same time. Or it's sort of like a uh, devil's double sort of situation and there's a, well one of them could be a, a body double of sorts. Right, back on track. The Rat King personally pities all humanity due to them being such greedy, feckless beings. How's that though, to be pitied by a rat? At least he's a royal one. But in Dark Souls 2, we learn from the Rat King himself that long ago an accord was struck between human and rat kind. Long ago, I struck an accord with a human chieftain. It was agreed humans would rule the lands lapped by the sun's rays and rats all that was below. 
But humans are liars all, schemers and cheats, creatures of greed. The time came they broke their word and hunted us down. I had their word, the underworld was ours to rule, untouched as it is by the rays of the sun. The more humans coveted, the more blinded they became as to what truly mattered. So the deal was broken and a sort of secret war was fought between the two species over the next millennia. Now it's worth noting that it's not exactly uh, known when this uh, deal was first made and when it was then broken. It could have been before Dark Souls 1, it could have been after Dark Souls 1, it's really uh, tough to say. I like to imagine it happened in the beginning, as the Rat King sort of implies. I mean, it would make sense, the gods had the heavens of An Orlando, men had, you know, the ground kingdoms, and the rats could have everything beneath. But uh, not so shockingly, it was never meant to be. The humans wanted to create burial grounds, and to do that, the humans would need to tread places where the sun didn't shine, which, according to their deal, all fell under the domain of the rats. The humans presumably didn't try to ask the rats if they could make their burial grounds there, and instead probably just started killing them like the uh, disgusting vermin that they are. But that of course would always trigger the ire of the Rat King who would then send his hordes, along with the occasional Phantom Defender, to protect his lands. Now by the time Dark Souls 2 takes place, the Rat King only has two burrows left under his control. One located in the Grave of Saints protected by his Royal Rat Authority, basically a particularly large horde of rats. It's home to countless rat statues and it's clearly a part of their ancient kingdom. They've got countless rat sized tunnels that only they are able to travel through. And again, it's extremely uh, densely populated with rats. Particularly the regular corpse rat style of rat, much like the ones we saw in Dark Souls 1. And like their predecessors are also poisonous, but not to the uh, same level of intensity. And the other burrow that the Rat King managed to keep within his clutches is located in the Doors of Pharos. Now this burrow is protected by a unique subspecies of rat known as the Dog Rat. They're basically dogs with rat-like features, or I guess rats with dog-like features. They've got the rat tail and the rat hands and feet but canine bodies and a really goofy-like dog rat style face, like something in between for the face. The tongue sticking out makes it look distinctly dog-like, and uh, I can't help but be reminded of Gabe from Fallout New Vegas. You know, the giant cyber dog of Dr. Boris? God, that's such a good deal. See, I have to make a video on that someday. But anyway, this uh, horde, or rather pack of dog rats, is headed by a particularly massive dog rat with the uh, squad of little hound rats as a boss fight. Something fans have called the uh, meth sif boss fight is actually a pretty fun fight in my opinion. It gets way too much hate and I just really love how goofy his face is. He sort of looks like a bizarre cross between a spotted hyena and the last guardian from PlayStation 4. I mean, the dog rats in general have a pretty unique appearance, you know, like I already said, they've got, you know, rat-like features, dog legs, dog body. They're probably some type of hybrid between dog and rat, but whether this is a result of a natural, you know, interspecies breeding between the two, or rather a uh, forced one at the hands of a mad scientist like Aldia is sort of unclear. But I'd say the massive size of the Royal Rat Vanguard in particular is sort of possibly a hint that he might have come out of Aldia's lab. I mean, Aldia liked to make giant versions of a lot of enemies. Although, sure, there really isn't a lot of evidence that he made this particular one. It's just something to think about. Either way, whatever the case, the Royal Rat Vanguard, before he was called that, and his offspring were welcomed into the fold by the Rat King and became some of his most trusted retainers. <laughs> This guy appears to be one of the Rat King's uh, strongest assets. I mean, it's effectively his Kraken, you know, his uh, mythical beast that he has under his control. I think it's more than fitting for a uh, royal Rat King to have, uh, well, the rat version of a great beast. I mean, think back to the old Ivory King from Frozen Ilium Lois. He had those two pet cats. 
it's kingly to have fearsome beasts as pets, or in this case, guard dogs. And these lesser dog rats that appear to be the offspring or just kin of the big one, the big one is known as the Royal Rat Vanguard, by the way. He's a dog with a title. But his lesser kin are not only poisonous, but they are carrying the curse. Meaning if you get bit too many times by these guys, not only will you be poisoned, but you could also wind up petrified. So with only two burrows under his control, it would seem that this secret war hasn't exactly been going in favor of the Rat King. One of these burrows, the one in uh, the Doors of Pharaohs to be specific, the Rat King would have to share with a stocky race of warriors and craftsmen known as the Gurm. Essentially a dwarf-like race, but with a classic from Softian spin. Instead of being underground natives, they were actually banished to the subterranean lands by the humans who deemed them to be inferior, unworthy, and impure. And the fact that they were also susceptible to hollowing led to them being branded as threats to society by the very same humans, who also were prone to hollowing. Although, as we see in the game, the Gurm aren't completely gone, Lonesome Galvan is still kicking around selling his poison-themed wares, and while the others aren't completely hollowed out, Galvan does seem to be the only one still capable of speech, so perhaps that's why he's referred to as Lonesome. He's the last of his kind able to talk, and he's got no one left to converse with besides humans. Although it doesn't seem to bother him much, he is a merchant after all, and he doesn't really discriminate. His kinsmen may be hollowed out and not very talkative, but they aren't as far gone as they seem. They still cling to a singular purpose, one that they found deep beneath the earth they were banished from. Now, the exiling of the Gurm had some pretty unintended consequences for the humans, while also having some quite fortunate ramifications for the rats. The humans had basically given the Rat King an entire army of new allies. The Gurm gladly entered into his covenant and a peaceful coexistence was established. The rats now had the hardy Gurm to assist them in the defending of the burrows and the activating of the lockstone traps. And the Gurm, being the fine craftsmen that they were, built several statues in their image that doubled as defensive countermeasures. And despite being dubbed a threat to society due to the hollowing, they're still quite coherent, at least enough to remember their old alliance with the rats, as they are non-hostile to any of the rats or their human members of their covenant. They're still able to recognize who is of the Rat King's men and who's not. And I suppose that kind of makes them the perfect eternal guardians of the Rat King's lands. And all the rats had to do was offer these guys asylum in exchange. It was an extremely good deal for both parties involved, but it was definitely in favor of the Rat King. And the Gurms themselves clearly weren't a danger to rat society. I guess it sort of becomes an example of uh, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Or at least in this case, another rat's treasure. Perhaps the Rat King and his covenant provided the Gurm with an anchor of sorts. I know uh, they use anchors as weapons, but uh, you know what I mean. The Rat King covenant gave them something to hold on to in their hollowing. Something to keep them from completely fading away even if that thing they're holding on to was an alliance made out of desperation. Now, I suppose we should probably talk about the mysterious human members of the Rat Covenant, traitorous turncoats and wretched fools who would throw in their lot with the vermin. But while serving the rats is simple, seeking them out is a whole different story. It's said that one can only find the Rat King after an extremely long ordeal, generally underground, and they usually have to defeat one of his guardians to acquire an audience with him. And you'd think you'd have to really prove yourself, but I suppose defeating one of his guardians is proof enough that you're worthy. I did. The Rat King himself seemingly hates humanity and all humans, but he's not above employing one, which in retrospect is a very weaselly rat-like thing to do. He can't beat his enemy, so he might as well try and uh, get his enemy to do his work for him. And he generally encourages his human subjects to use the various pharaoh's lockstone traps to ensnare any who dare trespass upon his lands. Because due to the fact that the rats themselves lack opposable thumbs, they aren't actually capable of using any of these traps. Hence the need for a few human henchmen in his war against humankind. This is why the Rat King valued his human servants just as much as his rats, if not probably more so. Yeah, they were of the same species as his hated enemies, but that didn't change the fact that they were quite useful in a pinch. That's why it isn't so surprising that when the odd human finds his way into an audience with the Rat King, this eminently noble being gives them a chance to serve him rather than be his enemy. Which sure, could be seen as cowardly, but it is out of necessity. Humans even to the playing field. Oops. 
And true to his word, the Rat King will honor any of his human subjects the way he would any rat, showing that he is able to see the two races as equal, something that humans themselves would probably never even begin to consider. And there have been a lot of prolific human members of his Rat King Covenant, namely the guy who forged the Covenant Ring in the first place. And many believe that the mysterious Pharos was also an ally of the Rat Kings given that the uh, contraptions he's famous for building are located in both of the Rat King's burrows. Well, they are located all across Strand Lake, and there's that one in Frozen Ilium Lois, but there's the highest concentration of them in the Grave of Saints and the Doors of Pharaohs, which happens to be where the uh, two domains of the Rat King happen to be. Now, despite the ancient pact being broken between the rats and humans, the rats do still seem to honor their end of the agreement by remaining underground or amongst the shadows, never really setting foot in the sunlight. Obviously, the same can't be said for the humans, but it's an interesting observation. Now, fast forward to the events of Dark Souls 3, and we get to see how this uh, secret war has progressed. By this point, the rats have taken to consuming the unkindled as well as the undead, evidenced by the fact that they occasionally drop embers. And the average rat's appearance is much the same as it looked in Dark Souls 1 or the corpse rats in Dark Souls 2, but they're generally referred to as hound rats, so perhaps there's some hybrid between the two races of rat that we saw in Dark Souls 2. Now, like they did in Dark Souls 1, they come in various uh, sizes, well, big and small mainly. There doesn't appear to be any medium rats in this one. They've got the same undead looking composition. Open wounds, visible bones, lesion sores, they, uh, they look fucked off. Say what you want about Meth Sif and his uh, mini-me's, at least he didn't look this fucked. I know I mentioned it earlier, but I do find something genuinely adorable about Dark Souls 2's uh, dog rats. Mainly the Royal Rat Vanguard, but maybe it's just me. Anyway though, these Dark Souls 3 rats closely resemble their Dark Souls 1 counterparts in just about every way. And just like before, they tend to frequent dark places. In fact, that's mainly the only places you'll find them is sewers or dark like crypts and caverns. The one way they're different than all other previous rats is they don't afflict you with any kind of debuff. They're no longer poisonous and they no longer carry the curse. But I do think it's safe to say their uh, fighting reflexes have improved a bit. It's from my cage and learning the mysterious art of ninjutsu. But just like before, these guys like to stick to the darkness and to tombs mainly. Places like the catacombs of Karthus have a decent amount of rats. So just like in Dark Souls 2, they really like to hang out in burial mounds. It's kind of their thing. If you happen to bury your dead somewhere in the Dark Souls universe, eventually rats will show up and settle there. But there's two particular rat hordes I want to call attention to. The first is pretty small and it's located early on in the game in the infamous undead settlement. Or rather, beneath it. Now you may have already noticed the somewhat large foraging party of rats located in the sewers of the settlement. I can't quite confirm it, but I'm almost certain they're part of the same burrow of rats as the one beneath the settlement proper. Now again, it's not a particularly large burrow, but it is fiercely protected. They've posted one rat sentry to watch the doors, while other rats wait inside their little burrow tunnels. And if the sentry is alerted, or even if he's silently taken out and a human manages to set foot on the rat's sovereign ground, they're instantly ambushed and attacked by at least six rats, which is probably more than enough for the first time player who accidentally stumbled on this. Now the other burrow in question, located deep beneath Irithyll Dungeon, is somewhat larger and it seems to have been created by repurposing old small sewer tunnels that ran through and beneath the prison. These rats in particular have a pretty nice setup. All the human meat they could ever want to eat, basically an endless fucking supply, and an imprisoned giant to do most of their killing for them. In fact, he probably stomps shit into a fine human soup kind of mush, perfect for the rats to eat. And the rats have seemingly constructed their new burrow around this unique ecosystem. And if that wasn't enough, they appear to have established a sort of dedicated food foraging route just in case they ever do run low on food. The route seemingly goes between their lair and the giant's pit all the way into the inner torture chambers of the prison where countless dead lie. And it should probably go without saying that the rats fiercely protect this little uh, food trail. They place two particularly large hound rats at the end of this trail to deter or eat any potential escapees from the inner torture chambers. Meanwhile, several other normal-sized hound rats can be found foraging in the sewers just a little bit ways down the path. 
As we can see, it wasn't very difficult for them to turn this intricate set of sewer tunnels into a highly efficient rat burrow. The Rat King would probably be proud. Now, speaking of the devil, it's not currently known if the Rat King still lives by the events of Dark Souls 3, but his subjects appear to continue his fight regardless. Perhaps he appointed some successor and there's a current Rat King who isn't the same one that we know, but is still, you know, carrying out the old Rat King's dreams. Who knows though, the Rat King did seem quite old, I don't think he, it's possible for him to die of old age. Perhaps the only real answer is that he faded into history like the other animal themed covenant leaders. None of them seem to be around by the events of Dark Souls 3 and most covenants don't have an animal leader anymore with the exception of the watchdogs of Farron. Although I do have one wonder and that's if there are still human allies amongst the rats. I mean there's no more lockstone traps for them to use so uh, who knows I guess. But those two burrows I talked about, they are very reminiscent of the burrows we saw in Dark Souls 2. So that leads me to believe that the rats still have the same hierarchy and structure, or at least the same behavior patterns. It is interesting to note that they had two burrows in Dark Souls 2 and two possible burrows in Dark Souls 3, showing us that the Rat King's uh, lands, they never really did uh, expand, did they? Instead, the rats appear to be clutching what lands they do still possess rather ferociously. And it should also be worth noting, and I probably already mentioned it, but the rats in Dark Souls 3 do not possess the curse anymore, nor are they poisonous, so perhaps that's showing that they're uh, evolving in some way. Although I do think the only reason that they don't still drop humanity is because it's not an available uh, item in Dark Souls 3, which is why instead they occasionally will drop an ember. Or perhaps by this state in the cycle, humanity is no longer really in the bodies that the rats are eating. Perhaps they've for the most part all become dreads and have formed the bedrock of the world as Aldrich would put it. You know, humanity is no longer food for the rats, it's uh, fuel for the merkmen. But uh, that's enough uh, rambling. But I believe that's all I needed to say about rats in the uh, Dark Souls trilogy. Rats of course also appear in Bloodborne, although not really quite as frequently. You can find them in those sewers and aqueducts in central Yharnam as well as the extremely atmospheric research hall. They're easily distinguishable by their glowing eyes, and if you happen to be a chalice dungeon delver, then you're more than familiar with these guys. I personally didn't start doing chalice dungeons until like a couple years after I played the game for the first time, but yeah, it's always a fun way to kill time. But of course, how could I not mention the rats from From Software's latest release, Elden Ring? Now again, they fulfill the same function as the rats from the other games, with one unique distinction. Now besides all their usual haunts, rats often find themselves in places afflicted with the frenzied flame, likely due to the extremely high death toll setting off a dinner bell of sorts, but also due to the ailing nature of these condemned places. The rats consume the afflicted flesh, or perhaps they go a step further and also eat the eye of yellow plants, and then gain the yellow fires of madness in their eyes. It's pretty noticeable, especially so in the really large ones. Now, a lot of things can become affected by the uh, frenzied flame in this game. We've seen it happen to some of the Miranda flowers. The average knight, soldier, or peasant is generally no match for the uh, excruciating truth of the one great. But it's worth noting how similarly affected both rats and humankind are by the flame's eldritch abilities. I guess we're not so different after all. But yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say about the various rats of FromSoft. I know Sekiro has a different kind of rat. That'll be a video for when I uh, decide to replay Sekiro. But as always, I hope you guys found the video to be at least somewhat informative or amusing. And if you liked it, please like it. If you disliked it, please dislike it. And if you like hearing me ramble on about these various lore topics and various other things uh, lore related uh, from various games, you know then please consider subscribing. I'm also setting up this uh, coffee account, so if you know if you feel the need to uh, toss a guy a buck, then that'll be an option too. I don't even like asking for that kind of shit. It always just feels, uh, I don't know, weird. But yeah, please consider subscribing. We've got a lot of uh, cool stuff on the way, but without uh, further ado, let's have our outro and then some final thoughts where I talk about the Rats of Wind Waker. Those rat merchants are great, aren't they? 
I know some people find that little feature in Wind Waker to be pointless, the fact that you can toss some bait at a rat hole and a rat will pop out and try and hustle you, but I think it really added to the overall atmosphere and style of Wind Waker, because when you're not talking to the rats, they are trying to rob you almost 100% of the time, and if you throw them some bait and get them to, you know, have a chat, they're still trying to get over on you, but in a different way. I don't know why I found that worth mentioning, it just was on my mind I guess, but uh, we got a lot of good stuff coming, the Aldia video, I got one about why Dark Souls 2 feels so different, got a lot of good stuff coming that I really want to show you guys, so stay tuned for that, and uh, I think that's all I uh, wanted to say, so I will let you guys go, as always, be safe, and I will see you next time.